Crypto Trader is proudly brought to you by eToro. Discover a simpler way to trade and invest in cryptocurrencies and more. Crypto Trader World Tour continues and this week we're coming to you from Berlin. In fact, this right here is the Berlin Wall. For years during the Cold War, this used to be the capital for espionage and spy games, a hub for cryptographers. Today, Berlin is the crypto capital of Europe. So join me as we take a tour of Crypto Berlin from east to west. We met our guide at the Brandenburg Gate when we ran into a protest and a party. Berlin is famous for its parties and it's probably a great place for crypto people to set up their shop. Our guide Hugo went to join his crypto friends and we headed off to cover the Blockshow Europe conference. the godfather of decentralization. Why is it all out war against the banks? That's a crazy statement. It's controversial. Tell me why. Host at CNBC, Crypto Trader Show, the top 10 most influential people in the blockchain. Ron Neuner. Not gonna come out. Now, if you watched my show last week, you'll remember that we had Charlie Lee as the centerpiece of my show, and he spoke about his personal investing portfolio, or the investments that he makes in cryptocurrency. Well, I traveled 7,000 miles, and I found his brother, Bobby Lee, in Berlin, and he's got something very controversial. He says that the blockchain cannot be used for any real-world applications. Yeah, you heard right. The blockchain cannot be used for any real-world applications. Bobby. That's a crazy statement. It's controversial. It Tell me why. So I'm going to clarify the statement a little bit first. So for the very specific database that we call the blockchain, that's been invented with Bitcoin in 2009. And that type of database, the blockchain, actually cannot be used for real world activities, real world stuff. And the reason is that people all think and all know that blockchain is immutable. It's public, meaning the data is public. It's repli replicated around the world. It's decentralized and distributed and it uses proof of work or proof of stake and so on and so forth. That's all good. But people often forget that the data that goes into a block, into the blockchain, first has to be publicly verifiable. What does that mean? It means that the data goes in. If it's not without controversy, then it's essentially my private information. Okay. Right, think about it. Just something simple. What's the temperature here in this room? Just 30 take degrees. A, 30 degrees. So if you were to put that data into the blockchain, let's say, you, let's say we have a blockchain just for your records of all the city temperatures in the world, and you put in here 30 degrees for Berlin. There's no one to dispute it because, because it could be 30.1 or 30.2. Well, that's, that's exactly. So I, I think it is disputable whether it is 30 degrees, because you might say it's 30.0, or you might round it to 30, but I might think it's only 29.97, or I might even say it's 28 degrees because we use a different thermometer. So the point that even the temperature data, people think of it as objective, is actually not objective. It's actually subjective because it's all about where you measure it, when you measure it, and to what granularity, okay. how many decimal places, right? So in that sense, temperature data is subjective. And if that subjective data is in the blockchain, either you own the blockchain and you're the centralized source of information, or it cannot go in the blockchain because people would dispute it. So what you're saying is in the Bitcoin blockchain, a transaction cannot be disputed. If I have 100 Bitcoin and I give you five, 100 less five equals 95, 95 plus five equals, equals 100. Five. Yeah, 95 goes back to you, the five comes to me. And as long as you have a private key, you use your private key for that, for that Bitcoin address to sign a message that says you took five out of the 100 and the 95 goes back to you, that message is, is internally consistent, what they call. So Meaning that message is true as long as 
the computers and the people around us use the same mathematics, which is cryptography. So you're saying that all these ICOs that are building blockchain related projects oh, yeah. should be built on databases. Exactly, exactly. So for example, a classic example is, oh, healthcare data on the blockchain. But well, what does that mean? Right? So does this person have diabetes? We put that in the blockchain. Well, who's to say he or she has diabetes? It's just one doctor's opinion. Right? Maybe one other doctor, one other crazy or whatever less capable doctor might say that patient doesn't have diabetes. Right? So, so that's my point. Whether or not a patient has diabetes, if it gets written to the blockchain, really what we're trusting is the doctor who wrote that into the blockchain. We're not trusting the blockchain itself. So what should we use the blockchain for other than spending and running money so, transactions, Bitcoin transactions? So I'll be honest with you. The blockchain was invented with the creation and the invention of Bitcoin. And to this day, and I've been in the industry for over five years, almost seven years, if you're counting when I first involved with Bitcoin itself. In the last seven years, I have yet, I've been thinking about this a lot. And my thesis about blockchain not being suitable for real world applications is only in the last six months. So it took me this long to come to this, come to this sort of pessimistic realization. And my current understanding is only cryptocurrency transactions, because they're so, they're so uh, virtual and uh, digital in nature and use mathematics, there's no controversy. You know, if this account has 1.00000 bitcoins, then that's what account has because that's according to the blockchain has 1.00. It's not about 0 0.999 rounded up, nor is it about 1.001 rounded down. So everything's very precise. So what right. you're saying is huge implications for the current, if your thesis is correct, then the current of, yeah. $200 billion or $150 billion in the ICO market yeah. could just disappear. Well, it wouldn't disappear. Some of the projects are decent if they really reclassified what they're doing as using a database. So the analogy I give is United Airlines, they have a mileage reward program called Mileage Plus. So that's a very decent program. It's been around for over 30 years, and I, I was a member since the 1980s. So I, I collect these miles flying United Airlines. Um, it's a good program. It's a win-win program. United is profitable. Customers are happy. People get rewarded. But it's, it's a database incentive. project. It's a database project. United and should they, store the miles on a decentralized central database that's right. where no employee right. can tamper with it. Exactly. They, they use high security, no employees tamper with it. And they even share the database with their Star Alliance partners. There's many airlines, Lufthansa and a bunch of airlines. They all share the data and they do nightly or whatever hourly sharing. And that's all good. But they don't call it blockchain. And they're not going to raise an ICO for it because they're mature companies. But you have an immature group of young people and they do the, something similar. They call it blockchain. They raise however many million dollars. And to me, that's being intellectually dishonest. So intellectual dishonesty and yeah. certainly that could have huge implications. Let's talk about implications. Let's talk about the market today. Yeah. You've been in the market admittedly for a long time. I think you mentioned seven years. We're back at $7,000 on Bitcoin. Is yes. Should we be worried? Should we be scared? I, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. The reason is this. I've seen Bitcoin long enough to know that ups and downs are normal. I'm not too worried because I know two things. One is it could get lower. The other is one day when it does get higher, it's going to go way higher than $20,000. And I've seen this cycle multiple times to have built in a model for myself. I think it's going to it's going to be like And that brings me to my next question. We asked your brother when he was here last week, we asked him what tokens does he personally invest in? What coins, currencies does he personally invest in? Yeah. So, so let me guess, let me guess. We're talking about Bitcoin? Yes, Bitcoin. You'd be bad if you didn't follow your brother, so Litecoin. There's Litecoin. So you hold more Litecoin than your brother, actually. Well, I hold some. I don't know. I think, I think he doesn't hold any more, any anymore, but uh, yes. What are the other two? The other two are um, uh, Ethereum, which probably shouldn't surprise anyone. I, I actually do hold Ethereum now. I bought some. Uh, and the fourth one is actually Bitcoin Cash. So I've had Bitcoin Cash from, from day one. From the fork? Yes. Let's talk about Bitcoin. You look like a Bitcoin man. I'm a trader myself, actually. I'm trading uh, Bitcoin from an in in investment bank. Bitcoin is hovering around 7,000 US dollars. Are you worried? No. Yeah. Is it the bottom? Some would say yes, some would say no. I don't know. <laughs> I see from my own experience, our trading team sees that there is a great accumulation at 5,000. So I think that's where the institutional money, money will lay down. We see uh, regressing investors 
it may go lower, it may go higher, but it's never too late to get into crypto, uh, whatever the price. Almost 90-90% people do not know what is the blockchain and what is the uh, Bitcoin. People are still pretty positive, like at the end of the year, that we'll see maybe like a 20,000 kind of Bitcoin. This is the floor, it's gonna rise up. You know, things like Lightning Network, when that's fully rolled out, you know, it'll make it a lot more accessible. Is this I the mean, bottom? No, no. <laughs> it can go lower any second, but I'm uh, I'm being optimistic. Like all my money is in crypto. I don't. I have like pennies in my wallet, but <laughs> all of it in the cloud. Are you buying? Yes, I am buying. I did. I just did. Yeah. You Are you buying at these prices? Of course. Of course, it would be a sin not to buy. If you're watching us on YouTube and you want more exclusive coverage, hit the subscribe button now. And just off the stage is Jimmy Wales, someone who's no stranger to the concept of decentralization. Jimmy, this is not a new thing for you, decentralization. When you see cryptocurrency, does it excite you? Uh, yeah, I'm super interested in the area. Um, I, I'm seeing uh, a huge amount of new ideas come out. Uh, a lot of them really bad, uh, some of them really good. And uh, it's kind of a fun, fun time to be you know, looking into this area. Now, you like the godfather of decentralization. You've built probably the biggest application of decentralization in the world. Do you see cryptocurrency as the next level of what you're doing? So there are parallels, of course. I mean, the idea that uh, decentralized systems can be robust, uh, that, that the assumption that you need a central authority uh, can be changed. Uh, but of course, there's also a lot of things that are different. Uh, Wikipedia, of course, is not a currency model, it's not a marketplace, it's not a distributed ledger. Uh, it does have a centralized database in a very old-fashioned kind of way. Uh, but I do see a lot of uh, parallels in the spirit of the community, the geeky community. The spirit of com community indeed. Now today you announced on the stage that you're actually launching a new venture. Tell us a bit about the new venture. So wikitribune.com uh, is a new platform uh, for news, uh, bringing together paid professional journalists and community members to work together side by side to try to do high quality neutral journalism. And uh, well, it's a pilot project, I'm having a lot of fun. Is there a reward mechanism? Uh, no, there's not. It's very much like Wikipedia. Uh, we want people to come out of a passion for truth and a passion for knowledge. Uh, I think the reward mechanisms uh, that sometimes people envision uh, might not be the best thing. Uh, I think uh, we would all agree we don't want to see journalists being paid directly by the companies they report on. And that's the kind of thing that sometimes people in the crypto space think would be a good idea until they think it through. Now, Jimmy, you've been quite a vocalist or a skeptic around cryptocurrency. What's the source of your skepticism? Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing is we're in a bubble. Uh, that is pretty clear. And I think even the biggest advocates of, of crypto would kind of agree that there's a lot of stuff going on. There are a lot of the ICOs uh, that are borderline scams. And I think that's problematic. I think, it, I think people in the crypto industry should be concerned about it. Uh, it tarnishes the, the image of the industry. Uh, and for small investors, uh, it's incredibly dangerous. Uh, of course, I lived through the dot-com uh, boom and bust. You can say a lot of the same things about what happened there. Uh, I remember a, a lot of businesses raised a lot of money. Uh, we had a lot of IPOs of companies that were pretty thin on the ground. Uh, and a lot of people lost a lot of money. So this isn't a new phenomenon. And is government or central government, centralized government regulation, the answer to the ICO scams? Uh, I think in part, uh, although the word regulation is a bit tricky, but uh, you know, stealing money is against the law. And I do think that governments should be investing more in looking into this space. And I think people in the crypto space should welcome that kind of scrutiny because they're the ones being scammed in, in, in large part. Now, I guess the question in everyone's mind is, are you a hodler? Uh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I actually, uh, I tend to, if, if, if I get Bitcoin, I tend to sell it immediately. Uh, I'm not a speculator. Uh, I don't know which way the price is going up or down. Uh, I think I've got a bit of Ethereum sitting around somewhere, but not, not material to my overall. And how did you first get into Bitcoin? Or when was the first time you personally bought a Bitcoin? Uh, so a, a few years back, I mean, you can look it up on Twitter because I, I, I bought uh, one tenth of a Bitcoin. Uh, the price, I remember the moment I bought it, the price was 666, which I thought was quite amusing. Uh, and then at the checkout process, it said, do you want to tweet about your purchase? And I did. Uh, and then somebody said, tweet your Bitcoin address. And I did. And uh, people gave me $20,000 over the next day. Obviously not to me personally. That's 
they did give it to me personally, but I donated it all to Wikipedia because that's what people intended. So maybe I'm going to tweet out my Bitcoin address and maybe I'll get $20,000 after this interview. Fantastic. Jimmy, very nice to have you on Crypto Trader. Thank you very great. much. Very good. Where's it going? I have no idea, man, but I definitely think it's going to be higher. Um, I'm not much of a TA guy. I'm just a guy that just believes in Bitcoin, so I think it's going to go up. There's going to be more demand for it. What do you think? $7,000 of Bitcoin. Have we seen the bottom? Are you talking about the current downtrend we're in? Um, I mean, it's honestly tough to say. $7,000 for one Bitcoin. Is that the bottom? I don't believe so. I'm more on the side that it'll probably touch somewhere in the six range. Do you think there's any chance that we're going to go down to $2,000 or $3,000? No. If it does, then I'll, I'll liquidate my mom's house and I'll go in. <laughs> Tell me you got that. <laughs> It's all out war against the banks, my next guest says, and there's no middle ground. Alex Schmissinski, back on our show again, good to have you. Thanks for having me. Why is it all out war against the banks? Well, I don't think uh, that there is another way, right? I mean, it's not like I love war. I was in the military for several years, believe me. The last thing I, I want to see is, uh, is violence, but the, this is inevitable. You have uh, 700 years of centralization where the banks are the biggest winners, they hold more assets and generate more profit than anyone else, uh, being disrupted by a new tsunami of decentralization. So I understand the concept of decentralization and I understand where we are in the cycle of decentralization. But let's take the user, the man in the street. Don't they need to have someone to call when something goes wrong? Don't they need a financial institution to assist them in their transactions? First, you're 100% right. I, I agree that the user interface, the user experience is horrible. And, and I'm old enough to have been around the internet back when you had to put the IP address if you wanted to send somebody an email. But you're right uh, from, a, from a context that, for example, Facebook and Google are now more than half of the entire internet. But at the same time, we also got other great things. If you think about email as an open application that everybody can use, if you think about voice over IP, which I uh, invented back in 1994, that is the largest decentralized uh, platform where no one owns it, no one is in charge, no one charges for it, yet it's safe, scalable, and available, right? So at, at, at any time. So we, we as users can decide, are we gonna let the monopolies dominate or are we gonna let this decentralization wave come and continue the promise of what the internet was supposed to be? But the network effect dictates that in a decentralized environment, people are going to congregate around the most popular nodes or the most popular service providers. So aren't we gonna be in a position where we all just congregate around the best service providers and create this new form of centralization? So WhatsApp is a great example of a very concentrated node, yet it charges nothing and it provides service to 1.3 billion people around the planet. So, But it does, have, it does have censorship rights in a way. It does have access to your conversations. And we've seen that in the event of a murder or a serious crime, WhatsApp will give those to the FBI. Which is the right thing to do. So I, I don't, when I say uh, decentralization, I don't mean anarchism, right? What I mean is that you don't have a toll collector, a guy between you and me who decides how much to pay to charge you or if give you access at all or not. The majority of the population on the planet does not have access to credit or to is underbanked because uh, people like the banks decide who gets access and who doesn't get access. And our entire economy is built on the fact that the people at the top extract the most value because seven billion people are at the bottom of the pyramid. If you allow everybody to come in and be equal and have equal opportunity, then by definition, you're gonna be taking from the people at the top. What happens to the existing banking system they in this disappear. revolution? They disappear. Over time, they disappear. Because if I'm doing everything in your best interest, and the bank is not doing everything in your best interest, then you're gonna stop giving your money to the bank. You're gonna put your money somewhere else. If you don't give banks deposits, they dry off, they die, they wither away. I'm telling you, now it's MOIP, money over IP. Hey, banks, you, I, I hope you're watching this. The game is over. Go find another business. That's Alex Mashinsky. He's the CEO of the Celsius Network, a peer-to-peer -peer lending network using crypto. If you want to see more about uh, Celsius, the website is? 
www.celsius.network. That's www.celsius.network. If you're enjoying our coverage of Block Show Berlin and you want to see more conferences, hit the subscribe button now. What do you think of the Berlin crypto scene? It's getting big, it's getting big everywhere and Berlin is no exception. I think that the community is quite mature right now. Is it a big community? It's growing hugely, especially over the last six months. There's many thousands of investors and participants. The way they are organized, it is perfect. The blockchain scene in Berlin is pretty um, incredible, actually. Uh, there's a very large, diverse pool of companies and things going on here. We took a break from the conference and hit the streets of Berlin to go and see the real crypto scene. Lisk is one of the biggest projects to come out of Berlin. At the time when they did the ICO, they raised $6 million, making it the second biggest ICO at the time. I decided to catch up with the founders. Yeah, Good to see you. Good to see you. So currently we are really in the heart of Berlin. For example, it's really cool. You can see the Alexander TV tower from our office. It's cool. quite unique, you know. So the core team spans all over here. Here we have more developers working on Lisk Commander, Lisk Elements, Lisk Explorer. Here's our DevOps team making sure that all our servers are running fine and nicely in a very secure way. Moving over to our front-end team, building our amazing user facing products like Lisk Hub. So here we have the whole marketing, design and community management department. It's a lot of young energy here. It's a lot of yeah. young creative energy. Max, uh, the second biggest ICO to be held at the time. You must be quite proud. Tell me the story about Lisk. So Lisk started with the idea to bring more developers into the space. And I was at that time working with a good friend of mine and now my partner Oliver Beddows in another cryptocurrency startup. And we decided, okay, we need to bring this industry forward. We need to get more developers into, into the field. We need to get more experiments going on. And how are we going to do that? Now, today, if I'm a developer and I want to develop onto Lisk, what do I need to know? What languages do I need to know? How do I, how do I use it? In order to jump on board, you basically just need to know JavaScript and you need to know the specifics about blockchain technology that you have like an immutable ledger which you cannot manipulate or change afterwards. So it comes with some specific attributes, you know. So just to recap, you've got the main Lisk blockchain and any developer who wants to develop doesn't develop into the main Lisk blockchain, but they develop their own side chains. And in, those, in their own side chain, they can develop whatever functionality they want, smart contracts and, and everything else. Yeah. But then the side chain plugs back into the main chain to create a bigger community effect. Exactly, exactly. So um, we separate also business from development. So all business activities like doing the ICO, creating a token and so on, this happens on the Lisk main chain. Because I think a business person doesn't want to develop a smart contract just to raise money in an ICO. This is, for example, necessary with Ethereum to create an ERC-20 token to conduct an ICO. And at the end of the day, I was talking about this network of networks, what Lisk is, or what Lisk will evolve into. And that means you will be able to use other applications on this network for your own sake. So let's say you, someone is developing a decentralized storage service on Lisk, and you need a decentralized storage service for your own decentralized application you are building on Lisk. So you can use the existing app instead of reinventing the wheel. Now, the speed of the current blockchain, how fast is your blockchain? We have a block time of 10 seconds. That means every 10 seconds there's a new block on the blockchain, which gives us a quite significant improvement if you compare it to Bitcoin's 10 minutes. I think the more important question is, how many transactions can your blockchain handle? And the reason why I'm asking is, are you going to fall into the same trap that Ethereum and Bitcoin fell into, where all of a sudden they couldn't handle the transaction volume? Yeah, so here's the cool thing. So we are based on delegate proof of stake, and this is super scalable if you compare it to proof of work. And if you compare Lisk, for example, to existing proof of work consensus algorithms um, or cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, we are not much better because we artificially cap 
the limit of transactions right now because we are still quite small. But you see with other players in the market who are using the same consensus algorithm that you can scale this thing massively up to hundreds of transactions per second. And this is definitely something you will be able to do with Lisk as well. Okay, so this all sounds amazing. But are there any projects actually building on the Lisk network at the moment? Every day I receive emails with interesting projects who want to build on Lisk, who want to do their ICO on Lisk. But I always have to tell them, listen, Lisk is still quite early stage, so we are not ready for that. But there is, for example, Madana, which is building a data privacy marketplace. They're also based here in Berlin. And they're going to do probably one of the first ICOs on Lisk. They're quite significant for us because it's our first use case and we're quite proud that people really want to build on Lisk. We look at the Lisk market capitalization today, it's very close to a billion dollars or hovering around a billion dollars. Do you think this valuation is justified? What is it that's exciting the market so much about a project that's so young? I would say it's the promise for the future. If you compare today's market cap to our maximum just a few months ago, it was I think around 4.5 billion even, um, then people really believe into it. People want to believe, people need to believe because Lisk is something the blockchain industry just needs. Max, we're in Berlin. There are 40 amazing, talented people here working for you in Berlin. Is there a big blockchain community in Berlin? To be honest, Berlin is the hotspot of blockchain in Europe because now there are, there are Gnosis, there's uh, Neufund, there's Madana, there's Moondog, there's Bitwala and many, many more amazing projects. And why do you think Berlin has become this hub? What is it about Berlin that makes Berlin so special? Berlin was, I think, always like a very attractive point for startups in general. So the infrastructure was here already. There are venture capitalists, there are the accelerators, the incubators, um, the wipe is here, the meetups are here, the people are here, the talents are, are here, you know. So it was quite an obvious choice for the blockchain sector to move here as well. Max, it's been a great pleasure having you on Crypto Trader. You've certainly given us some great insights both on blockchain and on blockchain Berlin. So it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. One of the most exciting projects to come out of Berlin is the Ocean Protocol. They recently finished quite a big raise and I've got their founder Bruce Pond with me. Bruce, Ocean Protocol, lots of hype here in Berlin. What's all the hype about? Berlin is one of the centers of the world for deep tech and blockchain. Tell me more about the Berlin cryptocurrency scene. It's awesome. It started with uh, one little bar accepting Bitcoin and since then it's been a center of innovation with Ethereum, with IOTA, with Ocean Protocol and a whole bunch of other interesting projects. Now speaking about hype, there's been a lot of hype around Ocean Protocol. What is Ocean Protocol? Ocean Protocol is a decentralized data and services sharing platform. Um, we started it because we realized that a lot of data was siloed. It was kept in Facebook and Google, and it wasn't being shared for purposes that people wanted it to be, solving problems like disease, um, making autonomous cars safer, and also putting a price on the data so that individuals could take control of their data. And how does Ocean Protocol solve the problem? Ocean Protocol, at the most fundam fundamental level, has a proofing system of uh, making sure data is available, and then uh, capturing transactions on how that data or service has been used. Let's talk about a practical example of how healthcare can use Ocean Protocol in its journey to solve or create cures for diseases. Sure. I, I, if you look at um, mm -hmm. medicine and research, uh, typically that research is stored in hospitals or universities, and when that the data is collected on whatever disease, the cancer or Parkinson's or what have you, it has to stay in that hospital um, because of privacy for patients and such. Ocean Protocol allows for that data to be shared in either in an anonymous way, processed in an anonymous way, so that people can share their data across border or borderless um, and get compensated using Ocean Tokens while respecting privacy, security and, and patient rights. So in this case, the hospital would be the data supplier who would be buying the data? 
can be any researcher who around the globe who has uh, AI algorithms, uh, people who are trying to solve the problem in places where maybe they don't have enough data, but they have the best algorithms. Now, Ocean Protocol is actually a collaboration or a partnership of Big Chain DB and the data exchange in Singapore, right? Tell me about the relationship. We started writing about how you could use data, combine data, blockchains, and AI in 2016. We did a prototype with Toyota Research Institute. We presented it at Consensus in 2017. And then DEX, based out of Singapore, reached out to us because they were a centralized data exchange. But into the blockchain, and all of a sudden you've got this decentralized database. Correct. And you have control of the data or the service in the hands of the person who or the entity that owns it. And they can control access. From our side, we have, of course, the protocol and blockchain knowledge from five years ago when we were one of the very first blockchain startups in the world. You were one of the very first blockchain startups here in Berlin. Vitalik worked on Ocean Protocol, didn't he? Yes, so we, the, he was a contractor for us uh, along with uh, another contractor. We actually weren't aware that Vitalik worked for us, but um, afterwards we heard in blog posts, somebody wrote, yeah, when I was working on a scribe, I had hired Vitalik to build the very first protocol of, or very first uh, um, uh, prototype of uh, the Ascribe.io protocol, which is what we built initially. Cool, so now you guys are developing Ocean Protocol. When can we expect the mainnet to be live? We're targeting for the first quarter of 2019. And you recently raised money through a, a, a sale. How much money did you raise? We raised uh, 25 million US dollars, and it was a pre-launch. Um, to fund and build the network before we did a, a public token launch. And when are you doing a public token launch? First quarter of 2019, so when the mainnet is ready. So you're not going to issue an ERC20 token as a placeholder. You're going to wait until your mainnet goes live before you issue an Ocean Protocol token. Correct. We want to comply with many of the securities laws, particularly the SEC, uh, so that we the token remains compliant in, in as much as possible. Are you guys testing real use cases today? Are you guys actually working on any medical use cases or something that's practical? We're talking through many of these use cases. So just this morning, we were talking with a representative of the AI X Prize, AI for Good Foundation, uh, working with 30 UN organizations uh, to unlock their data for specific use cases of better cities, um, trying to um, reduce crime, having better traffic, these types of use cases. If our viewers want more information about Ocean Protocol, where can they go? Oceanprotocol.com. So simple as that. The data problem is a big one. The blockchain seems to be the solution. And you can find out more about Ocean Protocol at oceanprotocol.com. Just a reminder that if you are watching us on YouTube and you are enjoying this episode on Berlin, hit the subscribe button now. We're here at Full Node in Berlin. It's the largest crypto co-working space in Europe. And we're here with Hugo. Hugo, what is this place? This place is basically where like, the whole great crypto people hang out in Berlin, either have a full desk or just pass by and chill with great people. And tell me about some of the projects that are co-working in this space. So you have a few uh, projects that are close to the Ethereum ecosystem. You have Gnosis, uh, you have Raiden, which is building a layer two uh, scaling solution for the Ethereum blockchain. And basically, like, a lot of people are revolving uh, around that. Uh, but you also have like, other projects like Neufund, uh, and, uh, and Centrifuge, which are building uh, things a little bit differently. Now, you refer to Berlin as the crypto capital of Europe. Is it the crypto capital of Europe? It's really, really the crypto capital uh, of Europe now, and it used to be the actual capital of the world of spies. So it's kind of super linked uh, regarding, you know, having strong encryption, strong privacy attached. To this ecosystem. Tell me about crypto life here in Berlin. During the, the, the Cold War, you had a lot of spy here that was in between the East and the West. And then uh, you, you basically had the Stasi in Germany, which was a government, uh, a huge entity that was spying on all of the, of the people of Berlin. And so the people have suffered a lot for lo like the lack of privacy. And this kind of allergic reaction brought a lot of people that actually believe that now with the internet we have to be even more careful about the lack of privacy. Then in 2009, 2010, the crypto world started and a lot of people here were really, really early on uh, interested in the technology and it just grew from there. Hugo, some of the bigger projects that have come out of Berlin, what are they? So again, a lot, a lot of uh, the Berlin ecosystem is driven by the fact that Ethereum decided to create one of its largest offices in Berlin. 
So in the Ethereum ecosystem, if you're building on top of that, you got to be inbuilt in one way or another. And I would, for example, cite like the, the Neufen uh, folks that are just you know, next to here. Uh, you have the OS coin team that is really pretty stealth right now, but doing like a, a great job trying to decentralize uh, GitHub. And, um, and you have Ocean Protocol uh, that you might see also in Berlin trying to, to build like a decentralized uh, data marketplace uh, protocol uh, that have been doing something in the space for a long time already. You've also got Lisk, you've also got IOTA, which a lot of the IOTA developers are here in Berlin. So Hugo, before we take a walk around, how would you summarize Berlin? So it's funny because, you know, Berlin uh, has no industry. So basically Berlin is three things. It's crypto, it's government, and it's parties. So that's Berlin in a nutshell. Sounds like fun. Let's go take a walk around. Oh, so this is Neufon, tokenized equity. Hey. hey, how are you? Nice to meet you. So instead of selling traditional equity, paper equity, you allow companies to tokenize the equity and sell it. Actually, the equities that we're selling just gain representation on chain. So we're still selling the traditional equity. It's just that we're selling it in the form of tokens which have representation on blockchain. So is it a security token? Yes, it is actually a security token. Okay, now what makes you guys different from the other companies that are issuing securities tokens? We know about security, securitize, we know about polymath. What makes you guys different? So the main difference is that we do it under German jurisdiction in Europe and by uh, register, registering uh, securities on, uh, with German uh, authorities, you may offer those tokens worldwide. On top of that, we are community owned. So investors who invest through our platform uh, are actually becoming the owners of the platform itself. Everyone's talking about securities tokens as the next big thing. Is it the next big thing? And when can we expect this big thing to arrive? Actually, it is already the next big thing and it will arrive on our platform over the next couple of weeks. We'll be announcing the first companies that will conduct ETOs, equity token offerings with us. And those are big established companies with already established uh, investors, backed, and so on and so on. So you're not selling this, the dream. You're actually taking existing companies that have big market capitalizations and you're transforming, the, you're tokenizing their equity. Yeah. Yeah. Our biggest mission is to actually bring off-chain companies to the blockchain world and utilize the mechanisms and the technology of blockchain to allow them fundraise in a more efficient way on blockchain. What about liquidity? Liquidity is the big question that everyone is asking. Exactly. This is the awesome thing about blockchain that instantly uh, shares that until now are Ill illiquid on the market can get uh, liquid. But how can they be liquid? Where are the exchanges? Where are the platforms? Exactly. That's the next step in the whole process, equity tokens are, are, are ERC20 tokens, which will, be able, uh, which will be traded on any kind of uh, crypto exchanges that will have licenses. So you don't need to trade on T0 or Orderbook or one of the, the big securities token exchanges that are listing. You're saying you can trade them on any exchange? Technologically, yes. Yes, so uh, what we're doing, Neufund is a primary market for those tokens, for these equity tokens. Uh, and then we're currently working on collaboration models with secondary markets. Uh, some of them are stock markets, some of them are uh, cryptocurrency markets to establish a model of collaboration, how to sell those equity tokens in a fully legal way. Great. Now, if our viewers are excited and they want to invest, where can they go? Where can they go to read more about it? Go to Neufund.org and go to the tab of investing or fundraising. So if you buy into this thesis that securities tokens or equity securities tokens are the next big thing, go and visit the website. Okay. Thank you. Now let's go to Raiden. This is the Raiden team. Hey, how are you? Good. Let's go. Thank you for coming on to Crypto Trader. It sounds like you're working on a very exciting project. Tell us what Raiden actually is. So uh, Raiden is a, a layer two scaling solution for Ethereum. It's basically what the Lightning Network is for Bitcoin, uh, Raiden is for Ethereum. So Lightning is an off-chain solution for Bitcoin, which allows users or peers to act amongst each other and then to only ping the network every now and then so as to take the pressure off the network. Is that how Raiden works for Ethereum? Yeah, pretty much. But uh, one big difference is that uh, uh, you can trade, uh, not trade, <laughs> basically uh, transfer any ERC20 token and not only just Ether. So any ERC20 token, if I'm trading with you, we can trade all day and ping the Ethereum network once a day and therefore take the compression of the network. Yes, pretty much. And will this solve a lot of Ethereum scaling problems? Uh, so this will 
uh, only solve problems. So this applies only uh, to applications that have no on-chain side effects. So you want to have uh, unlimited token transfers between you, but they should have no on-chain side effects because then you would still need to go on-chain. Now, with the transactions that happen off the blockchain, are they still full and final, immutable, unchangeable? Is it, are those transactions that happen before we ping the Ethereum blockchain, are those transactions as secure as a normal transaction? Yes, so that is the whole point of the layer two. Uh, so off-chain should be, uh, the finality should be instant uh, and security should be guaranteed by the protocol. And that's what Raiden Protocol does? Exactly. Now, time frame for Raiden Protocol. Are you guys currently building it? Is it out? Is it in the public? Uh, we have a testnet uh, version uh, and we are working towards a mainnet release soon. Great. Now, you're Greek. You're not from Berlin, but you're here working in Berlin. Why Berlin? Uh, yeah, Berlin is basically the crypto capital of, of, uh, of Europe, I would say. And I was uh, situated here also before because I was working for the Ethereum Foundation. So I have been here since 2014. Great. It's so good to have you on Crypto Trader. Good luck with the project. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's go to Gnosis. Let's go. Everything really like is a decentralized prediction market and also a decentralized exchange. You know? Hey, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm Kira from Gnosis. So we're here in Berlin at Full Node. Why did Gnosis fund this? Yeah, we started the first blockchain co-working space because we were talking with Cosmos, the team that we partnered with. And the conversation started about one year ago with both teams looking to open up more space in Berlin. So Gnosis, some of our viewers don't know what it is. What is Gnosis? Mm -hmm. So Gnosis um, started originally as a company for a prediction market platform, but now we've expanded to try to build new market mechanisms. So everything from Dutch auctions to other mechanisms and ring trades. But basically our aim is to be able to create arbitrage free markets and platforms that anyone can access so that they have greater access to information, to assets, to ideas. Now there's three parts to Gnosis. There's the prediction market, there's mm -hmm. the vault, and then there's a decentralized exchange. Mm -hmm. How does the prediction market actually work? Mm -hmm. So for example, we have a beta running at the moment with kind of play money only tokens. And the idea behind it is we're kind of focusing on blockchain ecosystem questions. So it's not fully live as a platform at the moment, um, but the idea is that the questions focus around kind of cryptocurrency or blockchain related development. So we have the Cosmos Network question of whether it will be live by August 1st. Okay, what about the decentralized exchange? What has decentralized exchange got to do with the prediction mark? So with decentralized exchange, we're exploring a few proofs of concept with smart contracts, which are like blockchain development tools. And currently we're working on a contract that will be decentrally hosted and run by different people um, for Dutch auctions. But the idea is also we could do it for ring trades in the future, but basically being able to create arbitrage free markets. And so for the public, that means markets that can't be manipulated or um, can't be necessarily kind of manipulated by the people running them as well and you can be assured that they aren't. So it sounds exciting. When can we expect the decentralized exchange? Mm -hmm. um, well there's several projects going on at the moment related to decentralized exchange and we'll be working on them throughout the year. Awesome. And the last part is the vault or the very secure wallet. How do yeah, you link Gnosis the safe. Gnosis Safe? How, what is Gnosis Safe? Why is it linked to the project? Mm -hmm. So Gnosis Safe um, was a kind of smart contract as we call them in the blockchain space again um, that was just known for security um, and so this is taking that contract and building a personal edition and the main kind of pivotal idea behind Gnosis Safe is that you can use it like a 2FA app. So really making crypto useful to the public and that's one of the biggest things if we want to get adoption from the public we've got mm -hmm. to make the blockchain and crypto usable. Why Berlin? What's the crypto community like in Berlin? Well it's quite a Amazing. I mean, I went to my first Ethereum meetup in 2014, and I think the scene's been growing since then. And I'd also say that Berlin is different because we're very much focused on collaboration and more open source initiatives, and much less on the financial game, but the power of the technology instead. Everything sounds very exciting, but we've run out of time. I'll see you again soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. What are your favorite tokens for 2018? My favorite tokens is definitely EOS. Uh, I think Ethereum will also have some kind of growth this year. What else are you buying? Uh, I have Ripple, Ethereum and I have our tokens, the stream coins, DST. Give me some names. 
I really like uh, the my DFS token because I know the guys and they're doing the fantasy sports app and they're now doing the ICO. Xerox, Bancor, a Kyber token, I'm, ex I'm using all of those that I'm used, I'm actually excited about them. Well, I like Loki. If you heard of Loki, uh, the fork of Monero, I think that's going to be a huge token with, uh, with their own wallet. I like Midas Protocol and Work Venture. I think those are the two projects coming out of Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, you know, having Southeast Asia as a huge potential in terms of population and adoption of uh, the cryptocurrency space. I would be buying time to keep working on nice projects and to give this ecosystem some fresh breath again. This is a very strange picture, if you don't mind me saying. I've got one guy who's forking Z Classic, and I've got one guy who's wearing a Z Classic shirt. What's going on here? I'm Vic from Z Classic. It's Jake from Anonymous, and um, we have a team that would like to continue to develop Z Classic. So you're not the existing Z Classic team? No, we are not the, yet the official Z Classic team. We are the Z Classic Community Edition team, and we would like to become the, the next official development team. And we have decided to take the lead, to take the support of Z Classic and continue development. Okay, now you guys are, are sitting here and you're talking. Yes. Can I make an assumption that you're supporting the fork? Yes, we, as already we said and we publish, Z Classic will be forked, will be continue to be forking in the coming months, years. If they want to fork Z Classic, they could. It's open source. So we not compete. We have good discussion today. Great, uh, discussion, great today. discussion. We have the same problem as the resistance today. Now, Jake, you guys announced on our show a few weeks ago that you were forking Z Classic into Bitcoin Anonymous. You had a few issues with Bitcoin Private. How are your plans progressing in the fork? The plans with the fork are ahead of schedule as far as development goes. We are very excited with meeting individuals like Vic because Vic represents the new Z Classic team that's up and coming. And by having the new Z Classic team on our side, we're supporting them while they're supporting us. Our biggest problem we're currently facing is Equihash no longer being ASIC resistant. That issue, every team that has Equihash is currently facing. And if we work together versus fighting each other on it, we'd be able to solve the issue. Jake, when we last uh, published a story about the fork, if I'm not mistaken, Z Classic came out with a tweet that said that Z Classic is not forking. What actually happened? We actually spoke to the Bitcoin private team today about that because they said there was no devs behind it. And here we have devs behind it. And they said the fork was not, was not supported, didn't have consensus. Well, here's the fork at a major conference in Berlin for the fourth one in a month supporting it. So we explained to them that that tweet was misleading and we're hopeful that in the future they will either bring that down or redact it. Now, Jake, we are running out of time. Before I let you go, though, I must say the last time when we broke the story, we had a lot of critics that said that another scam. How do you respond to that? Is there going to be a white paper soon? Are we going to be able to see some code? Is your code going to be on GitHub? When can people confirm that this is actually a real fork? Of course. I'm excited to tell you the white paper comes out tomorrow. So by the time everyone's watching this episode, they'll be able to read the white paper. That is huge for a fork. Forks don't even have to have a white paper. We're going to have a white paper almost 30 pages long describing everything from the ecosystem to how the mining is going to work, to how the master nodes are going to be set up, the breakdown of all of it. Great, Jake. So if you want to see the white paper, where can we go? Anonymousbitcoin.io. Welcome back to the second day of the Block Show 2018 here in Berlin. Next up, please welcome on stage and then round of applause. Right. Now, this pitch competition that they had here today, you were one of the great pitchers up on the stage. What does your company do? What does your, your project do? Okay, so we are a new blockchain protocol uh, that is specializing in solving most of the problems like security, scalability, and speed. Uh, we use HyperDAC protocol that we invented, uh, which is DAG and blocks together. And we have multi-consensus algorithm, uh, which the key part of it is the mobile mining part. So let's slow down because some of our viewers aren't very technical. And you're using a lot of very technical terms. Okay. So all, in, all blockchains have certain problems today. Yes. Scalability, security, and speed. And speed. Those yes. are the three problems that all blockchains aim to solve. Yes. Now, how are you solving 
those problems? How come okay. you can compete with other blockchains that haven't managed to solve all those problems? Okay. So uh, we're solving the speed problem by introducing sharding and uh, combination of blocks in DAG. Uh, we have currently 60,000 transactions per second, which is more than Visa and MasterCard. Uh, that's how we're solving the speed problem. The security problem we're solving by multi-consensus algorithms together. So we have proof of work, proof of activity, which is the mobile phone mining, and proof of stake. So Nobody has three algorithms together for... Uh, so right uh, now, if you look that. at Bitcoin, Bitcoin has a proof of work yes. consensus algorithm. Ethereum is promising to move to a proof of stake yes. consensus algorithm. You've introduced a third one, which yes. is called proof of activity. Yeah. How does proof of activity work? So this is the mobile mining part. Uh, after the proof of work is done, uh, we start with proof of activity. Uh, it's another way to certify transactions or smart contracts using mobile phone. Uh, we use uh, very specialized uh, transactions. Uh, it doesn't kill the battery of mobile phone and doesn't kill the CPU. It's like another messenger running on your mobile phone. So let's talk practically. If me and you want to do a transaction and I want to send you some funds, I send you some funds. Talk to me about the process of the consensus. Okay. So those funds will uh, flow through, through three different processes. One of them is proof of work, which is very similar to the standard one. Uh, there will be additional certification of those transactions in proof of activity and one more additional check in proof of stake uh, to check uh, if, uh, if your funds are correct, uh, if you have enough funds, there is no double spending. So there are like three, three different processes to, to verify that everything is super secure and, and correct. Now, three different processes instead of one process. Yes. Doesn't that make each transaction processing time a lot longer? Uh, not in our case, because we have uh, the transaction process is done in parallel uh, on many different mobile phones, so, so it, it doesn't affect uh, the speed or the latency. So you're talking about 60,000 transactions per second today? Yes. yes. And is this on a testnet? It's on the testnet. Uh, we're going actually to uh, allow access to the testnet uh, to general public in a few weeks uh, in order also to test uh, the mobile phone mining on very big scalable system. Uh, and the product will be completely done end of summer. So I have a question for audience. Uh, who from the audience using proof of work uh, mining rigs here? Can you raise the hand, please? And who has mobile phone? That's a rhetorical question. So we have uh, we are using mobile phone as a default uh, device for uh, for our network. For the scalability part, uh, we use the mobile phone nodes, uh, blockchain mobile phone nodes, and we also have sharding implemented for, for the scalability part. And are you saying that anyone who's going to have a mobile phone effectively can run a proof of activity node? As long as he has an Android mobile phone uh, with one gigahertz of CPU and five uh, uh, gigabyte of, of memory, yes, he can do it. And when, when did you say your test net was going to be open to the public so we could all test it? Two, three weeks time it will be already open to the public. Okay, now, the big question is you've got millions of people with Android mobile phones that meet your specifications. Does this mean that your number of nodes is actually infinite? I mean, it's... It can be, yeah, it can be billions of nodes, yeah. And this is actually where we're aiming because uh, we see a very big potential in the developing markets. I was uh, living in Angola in Africa myself, for example. So there is very hard to find data centers or stable electricity, yeah, sure. but everybody has mobile phone and internet. So we want to bring to those people the applications like healthcare, banking, and also sorts of other blockchain applications that can really improve their life. Great. Now you guys are raising money for a token generation event or an ICO. Yeah, How much money are you raising? Uh, 24 million. You're raising 24 million as yes. a hard cap? Yes. And uh, are you going to open this up to the public? Uh, we're doing it only in private sale. Uh, but we're ready to open it to, to investors that pass our KYC and uh, they can contribute also something to the project. Great. And if our viewers want more information, where can they go? Do you have a website? Yeah, or of Telegram? course. We have, uh, we have Telegram, uh, we have a uh, website, anycum.com. So every, all the information, all our channels are there. So they can visit the website, read the white paper and connect with us on our Telegram channel. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot here. We all know that Electronium came out a few months ago and said that they could also do mining on the mobile phone. Now, Electronian hasn't been a very successful project by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. How, yeah, I know. how are you going to be different from Electronian? So I think uh, this is a like, very big problem of most of the blockchain projects. So uh, only 5% of the blockchain projects, they have a real product. 
and 84 they have only white paper, PowerPoint, slides. So we can put everything on slides. In our case, we created a product, we created a very good prototype, proof of activity is already working, and only after that we started the process of raising money. So uh, this is why we are probably be much more successful than Electronium. Before I let you go, I need to ask you one more question. Is it realistic to think that in a few years everybody is going to be mining some kind of cryptocurrency on their phone? Yeah, definitely. So look, I've unfortunately got a, an Apple phone. Okay. So this is not going to work for your product. No. So I'm going to throw it away. <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. I need to get an Android. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You should. Thank you very much for coming on Crypto Trader. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Another week, another country in our crypto trader world tour. I hope you've had as much fun from Berlin as we have. Next week, we'll be coming to you with our friends for a very special episode from the moon. Until next week, trade well, my friends. Crypto Trader is proudly brought to you by eToro. Discover a simpler way to trade and invest in cryptocurrencies and more.